thank you all so much. It is always a wonderful treat to get to come here to Lawrence and to spend time with all of you. And what a fantastic turnout. Um, this is, I've, all, I've said this many, many times, but I think this is one of the most cohesive and um, welcoming realtor associations. And there are a lot of them that are really good across the state, but I've always just been really amazed with the special thing that you have here in Lawrence. And so I, I appreciate getting to be a small part of it. Well, it's that time of year when we're putting together our annual housing forecast. And so you have at your tables a copy of the forecast. And I have to say a huge thank, once, thank you once again to Security First Title and to Meritrust for making it possible for us to do this. They cover all of the cost associated with the graphic design and the printing of these forecasts. And as you saw as you walked in, there are piles and piles of these forecasts over there. And we would really encourage you, and I know the Elbor staff would really appreciate you taking them back with you to your offices. Take stacks of them. Take a whole box if you want to. These are great to include with listing presentations or relocation packets or just general information when you're talking with a client or somebody in the community and you need some outside reference to say, this isn't just what I'm saying, here is what you have from the Center for Real Estate. And so that's why we do it. That's why Security First and Meritrust make, contribute to support that. It's a part of really supporting the general community. I also have to give a big thanks to the Kansas Association of Realtors and to the Lawrence Board of Realtors and all the realtor boards across the state. I don't know of another real estate program in the country that has a partnership the way that we do, where we are able to access directly all of your MLS data, and we then combine all of your, ver all of you use different vendors with different standards, we combine those all together so that we can create statewide MLS statistics that are prepared in a consistent fashion. And as a part of that contract that we have with the Kansas Association of Realtors, we are able then to provide you back with your monthly MLS statistical reports, which I think from everything I've heard you all found useful and, and, and valuable to have. And so we're, we're very pleased to be part of that partnership. We benefit at the university because then we have access to the data to be able to do the statistical analysis that we do with our forecast. So let's dive in. And I'm, you know, most, most of you know, I'm an economist by training. I spent the first part of my career at the Federal Reserve. And so I'm gonna go back and do some, I hope you're not gonna feel like you're back in class in college again, but hopefully you'll say this actually was valuable and interesting because this is one of the most interesting economic times that we've been in, certainly since the 2008 financial crisis, but in some ways even more interesting than that. And one of the questions that we're facing right now is this question of are we in a recession? And many of you may have learned when you were in your first economics class that the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. And that's sort of a rule of thumb that we've often used. And you can see from, from these slides here, technically speaking, the first two quarters of this year, we had negative economic growth. Just barely negative, but negative. By the way, on any of the slides that you see from me, if you see those gray shaded regions, those represent the official dates of recessions by the Recession Dating Committee, okay? We have, in this, in this graph, I think we have the recession from uh, 2001, the 2008, 2009 recession, and then the very brief one associated with the pandemic. The Recession Dating Committee is not an official government agency. It's a part of the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group of economists. And they define a recession based on sustained economic decline in economic activity that is widespread. That two quarters of negative economic growth is not their benchmark for defining a recession. They look at a number of different factors. And so sometimes you could have two consecutive quarters and not have a recession. And sometimes it could be different in the opposite way as well. The thing to remember is that they never call a recession until long after it started and often not until after it's over. 
Um, their goal is to be definitive. They don't want to change what they've claimed, and so they would rather be slow and get it right than be fast and have to change it later on. So I said, this is not the only thing they look at. Certainly, it's something that they do look at, but they also look at, at, at job growth, what's happening with total employment. And total employment growth has been really strong nationwide. That has continued to grow. And this slide shows total non-farm employment compared to the beginning of, 19, of, of 2020, so right before the onset of the pandemic. And it's the change since then. And so that green line that's at the top at the end is the United States total employment. It's now above zero. And what that means is that US total number of jobs is above where it was prior to the onset of the pandemic. Now, all of the other lines on there are lines that are relative to places near Lawrence. So I have Lawrence up there. I have Topeka as the red line. The orange line is Kansas City. And you can see that across Kansas, we are still below the level of employment that we had prior to the onset of the pandemic. And so we've struggled to regain all of our jobs numbers. By the way, all of these slides, if you're interested in them and you say, man, I'd like to get more, feel free to take pictures, post them on social media, whatever you want. But you can also access my PowerPoint presentation at the Center for Real Estate's website. You go to wichita.edu slash real estate and right there on the home page, you should see a link to the Lawrence uh, housing forecast presentation. So you can access those slides there. So our jobs numbers are down. We seem to not be fully recovered here in Kansas, but there's another measure that we have, which is the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rates, both nationwide and across the markets in Kansas, are at the lowest levels that we have ever seen. And so how do we reconcile this difference between, wait a minute, we have record low unemployment rates, and yet we haven't recovered with all of our jobs? Well, the jobs numbers are based on surveys of businesses. How many people are on your payrolls? How many people are on your payroll? And you add those numbers up. The unemployment rate figures are based on households. Do you have a job? Do you have a job? Are you currently actively looking for work? Okay? And so we can see differences in these two perspectives on the labor market for several reasons. One is that the household numbers may be, are based on where people live, whereas the jobs numbers are based on where people work. And so one story you could tell, and I don't think we have definitive data on this, is the rise of remote work. Could people who live in Kansas be working in other states but working remotely? Okay, So that could be one piece where our unemployment rates are low, but our jobs numbers haven't fully recovered. I think the other two factors are a bigger issue here. Number one, is that I think the pandemic pushed a lot of the baby boomers who were nearing retirement to retire sooner than they might have otherwise. We've been talking about this for a long time, the graying of all of these professions and how we need to get young people involved. Well, when we hit all of the hassles associated with the pandemic, it was in, for many people, it was, okay, it's time. I don't wanna deal with that, I'm quitting. And so we had a more rapid retirement than we might have otherwise. <clears throat> the second thing is that prior to the pandemic, do you remember all the concerns about the minimum wage and the pressures to increase the minimum wage and, and, and the, the struggles that we had at the lower lowest paid jobs and the very low incomes that they had? Well, we had very rapid wage increases, especially at those lower income levels. And you don't hear those talks about raising minimum wage. Why? Because the actual wage is so far above the proposed minimum wage that it's not really relevant anymore. And one of the things that that seems to have done is that suppose that you were a, a server, 
at a restaurant or somebody who was working at a fast food place or someplace like that or working at a hotel as a cleaning person. You may have needed two jobs to make ends meet. And even if one job could have done it, they wouldn't hire you for more than 30 hours because they didn't want to start having to pay benefits. And so you'd be working two jobs. But as the labor market has gotten so tight, more and more employers are willing to hire people full time, increasing their wages, especially at those lower end jobs. And now somebody who had been working two jobs may only be working one job. And so that also translates into not as many people employed, but because they'd show up twice on the employment numbers before, now they only show up once, but they're still employed from the unemployment rate statistics. So it is a very tight um, labor market, even if we haven't fully recovered all of our jobs. That would argue against us being in a recession right now. These are the numbers of the Center for Economic Development and Business Research. They just released last week their Kansas uh, forecast for total employment numbers. And of course, this year has been pretty strong employment growth for Kansas. 1.7% is where they project that will end 2022. But the broader forecast is for 2023. And this is their optimistic forecast for 2023 which is about 0.7% job growth for Kansas. That's okay, but not stellar. Their pessimistic forecast, and they, they're doing kind of a, a high and a low right now, is essentially for flat jobs numbers. They are not forecasting at this point a substantial decline in employment, even if we enter a recession. Instead, it would be just a, a really, really, you know, level numbers. And again, part of that's because the unemployment rate is so tight. Matter of fact, I saw an article in the, I think it was the Wall Street Journal yesterday, that was talking about businesses that were hoarding workers. So sometimes what happens in a downturn is that you lay people off because now your, your demand is down, you're, you're, you're struggling, and so you need to cut your payrolls. But they were seeing more and more evidence that businesses, even as they started to see demand slacken or they were concerned about their, their sales, they were so worried about losing the workers that they had that they were planning on keeping people on and just suffering from the lower profit as a result because they didn't want to lose those workers long term. Does that make sense? So, so I found that an interesting story in a discussion uh, and so I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that. It was an interesting question. The point is, even if we do enter a recession, it's not clear how deep and severe it would be from employment losses. So I'm going to go back and forth. You know, I think it was Harry Truman who said, give me a one-armed economist, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, I'm going to go back and forth with all of these different things that say, are we entering a recession? And one of them is this question of an inverted yield curve. So the yield curve is looking at treasury security interest rates. We have up here, the, across the x-axis, we have the three-month treasury security, the one-year treasury security, the five-year, and the 10-year. And ordinarily, we expect to see long-term interest rates be higher than short-term interest rates. Why? Because you're bearing more risk for lending out for a longer period of time. And the orange line at the bottom is where the yield curve was roughly one year ago, okay? October 8th, 2021. And you can see we had that. Short-term interest rates were basically zero. And then the 10-year treasury was a little over one and a half percent. That's an upward sloping yield curve, and that's normal. Right now, once you get past the very short terms, the yield curve you can see is downward sloping. The one-year yield for one-year treasury is a little above 4%, but the 10-year treasury is more like 3.8% right now. And so you see this downward sloping yield curve. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that drink went down the wrong way. <laughs> So we have this downward sloping yield curve. 
There are many economists that believe and, and say the yield, a downward sloping yield curve is a predictor of a recession. And indeed, there are many, many instances in the past when, when the yield curve inverts, within the next six months or so, the U.S. economy goes into recession. Now, I always tell my students that the inverted yield curve is not so much that, in, that a recession is imminent. It rather is reflective of the fact that investors believe that short-term interest rates, the one-year treasury, will have a lower rate in the future than it does today. And that's why they're willing to lend long-term at a lower interest rate than they're willing to lend short-term, is because they think short-term interest rates will fall in the future. Now, one reason those interest rates could fall is because we enter a recession, and then the Fed's got to bring down interest rates to combat the recession. That's one possible reason. It often happens. But it's also the case that it could simply be a reflection that investors think that interest rates are going to fall, that fall for other reasons. And one reason interest rates could fall right now is a lowering of inflation expectations. Okay, So to the extent that investors believe the Fed is going to get inflation under control, that would also justify a lower, longer-term interest rate. Which of those is the right story? We'll find out eventually, won't we? Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that both of those are there. One of the things that I wanted to talk, by the way, I, my, I've got a lot of slides here today, and, and, and so if you just get tired of it, just put your head down on your desk the way my <laughs> students do. That'll be my signal to wind things up. Um, but I wanted to give a, 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 an historic perspective so that we are not so tied to what's been happening here recently. We can have a lot of recency bias, especially over the last two years. And so this is what's happened with the Consumer Price Index measure of inflation since 1960. And there are two numbers up here. The dark line is, is the headline consumer inflation number. The orange line is what we call core CPI, or it's the Consumer Price Index with subtracting out food prices and energy prices. Food and energy prices tend to be much more volatile. They can go up, they can go down. And my, my personal favorite example of that here is back in, uh, oh, my, my, my pointer's not going to show on there, back in 2008 and 2009. Do you see where the consumer price index number shot way up? You remember when gas prices went above $4 a gallon and we were all just going, you know, banana bonkers back in 2008? That caused the underlying inflation number to jump above 5%, and, and oh my goodness, the sky was falling. Over the course of the next year, gas prices dropped down to about $2 a gallon, and we had negative inflation for the first time since the 1950s, okay? But notice that the core CPI number, the orange line, really didn't move that much through all of that volatility that we had with energy prices. What that meant is that the underlying inflation in the headline numbers from food and energy didn't feed its way into other goods and services, okay? But historically, if you go back, you'll notice that the core inflation number, especially as you go back in the 70s, that tended to follow what was happening with the headline number, okay? So that energy crisis in the 70s, and we drove up gas prices and all sorts of energy prices, that led to an increase in overall inflation, and core inflation quickly followed to the same level. They tended to move very closely with one another. The thing that I will note here most recently is that while through the 2000s, we weren't seeing as much a tighter relationship between core inflation and headline inflation. In this most recent run-up, we have seen it. Initially, it was an increase, and, and the core inflation numbers followed it pretty closely. So what is, well, let me talk about uh, this, this mortgage rates and inflation and just have some perspective there. And then I want to talk about what's driving inflation and, and, and the issues that we have there with that. Um, I thought it might be interesting to see a perspective of the 30-year fixed mortgage rate 
and how it relates to the underlying inflation number. Just think about what will happen with mortgage rates going forward. And you can see back in the 70s, again, 1975 and 1980, you saw that run-up of inflation that we had as, as the high inflation time in the 70s. And mortgage rates were kind of slow to follow that, but then once they hit, they went up even higher, topped out at around 18% back at the end of 1981, early 1982. And then as inflation dropped down, the Fed worked really, really hard to drive down inflation expectations. And you see inflation expectations drop, inflation dropped down to below 5% by 1983, but it took a long time for the mortgage rate to come down and be brought down following that. And that continued all the way through the, around 2020, most recently, the thing that's really striking, and I don't necessarily have a lot of, of insight in what this means, but that headline inflation number is jumped up quite a bit higher than the mortgage rate, which means where mortgage rates are right now, and this is the monthly average, so it may look a little low because it, it doesn't have the most recent spikes, um, but where those mortgage rates are is not consistent with lenders actually getting a real return on their investment. They're losing money by lending to your bar, to your buyers, okay? Um, so what drives inflation and what drives the mortgage rates and the component in mortgage rates? What really matters for the mortgage rate isn't where the inflation number is now, it's what do we expect inflation to be in the future? Okay, that's what really has to get built into the mortgage rate. And here are three measures that we have here. So the black line, the dark blue line on the top is the headline inflation number. I don't have the most recent number that was released yesterday, but it's about the same. 8.2%, I think, is what was released last night. Um, the teal line in the middle is a survey by the University of Michigan that asks households, what do you think the inflation rate will be over the coming year? That's a good measure of inflation expectations, but it's not perfect because you know, we all just sort of answer whatever we answer. The orange line on the bottom is a much more interesting number. It's called the five-year break-even rate. And what this measure does is it looks at what are financial markets where investors are placing their bets on what's going to happen in the market. Anybody know what the current line is for the Chiefs game this weekend? Nine. Nine? Yeah. Nine oh, point? Chiefs, no, Chiefs. Oh, you're talking about KU game. Yeah. Yeah. That's first. yeah. yeah. Oh, let's go with the KU game. Nine point line there, what we got. Okay? That line, initially, the, the, you know, Vegas sets that line, but ultimately what they do is they just change the line based on the dollars that are being bet. Right? If people bet... For KU, then, then that line is going to go up. If they bet against it, it's going to go down. That line is simply a reflection of the market price of everyone's expectations of the outcome of that game. Okay? Well, the same thing is true in financial markets. A traditional treasury security is typically, we say it has, say, a $1,000 par value bond. That means that you hold that bond when it matures five years later, it will pay you $1,000. Up till that time, it will pay you whatever interest rate, the yield on that bond, it will pay you semi-annual interest, okay? Well, a TIPS security, Treasury Inflation Protected Security, T-I-P-S, it is a treasury security that has a little twist to it. It starts out just like a traditional treasury security, a $1,000 par value bond, but at the end of the year, they go and they adjust the face value of that bond to reflect actual inflation that occurred. So if we had, say, 8% inflation over the past year and your, your $1,000 par value bond, it now just went up, and instead of paying you back $1,000 at the end, they'll pay you $1,080. They increase that par value to reflect actual inflation. And the interest, the payments that you get going forward, 
are going to be based on that $1,080 face value of the bond. Next year, they'll do the same thing. They'll increase the value of the bond based on actual inflation. And they'll do that every single year. And so with these tip securities, you don't have to build in inflation expectation into the interest rate because you're going to be protected on the back end for actual inflation that occurs. With traditional treasury securities, the money you get back is going to be eroded by actual inflation. You won't be able to buy as much stuff. And so you need to get a higher interest rate to compensate you for that risk. The difference between the interest rates on those two securities reflects investors' expectations about what will happen to the inflation rate in the future. And so this five-year break-even rate is a calculation that says, what's the one-year treasury security yielding right now? What is the one, the, the five-year treasury yielding right now? What is the five-year tips security yielding right now? And it's taking that difference. And that is, in essence, a market bet, just like the odds line on the KU game or on the Chiefs game. Here's the market bet as to what inflation will be on for the next five years. So that was a long explanation here, but here's the point. Investors who are putting down billions and billions and billions of dollars on this market are expecting that on average, the inflation rate over the next five years will be somewhere around 2.5%, even though the headline number right now is 8.2%. So that is a bet that one way or another, those inflation rates are going to go down. Does that mean inflation will decline? Not necessarily. But you know, just like with the KU line or the Chiefs line, just because that's what the line says, that isn't necessarily way, the way the game will play out. But if you always think you're going to beat the line, you're wrong. On average, <laughs> if you beat the line on average, you're doing very, very well because that's a hard thing to do. So that's my best guess as to what's going to happen with inflation going forward. And I think that's reflected in the current mortgage rate. I think it went up to 6.9% uh, yesterday was the most recent announcement, so it was a big increase. But even at that level, again, that's not reflective of the current 8.2% inflation rate. That level has to be related to a lower interest rate. And the Mortgage Bankers Association, I did check again last night just to see if they'd revised their forecast. Through the end of 2023, they are forecasting that mortgage rates will fall to uh, 5%, okay? So will they be right? They could be wrong. They've been wrong in the past. Any economic forecast is like playing pin the tail on the donkey with darts, okay? But, but that is a reflection, I think, of, of that short-term interest rates have to come down, even as long-term interest rates are higher. So before I jump on with that, any questions, any things that you wanted to, me to go through and talk about? Yes? You say short-term interest rates have to come down. How long is short-term interest rates? Generally, when we're talking about short-term interest rates, we often mean the one-year treasury security. That's kind of our, our, our starting point. But one, you know, the other piece that you have, where does the Fed actually impact interest rates? They move what's called the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is, is kind of a strange misnomer. It's not actually something that the Federal Reserve lends out. It is the rate at which large financial institutions lend money to each other overnight. Okay, so the Fed funds rate is this market interest rate of, of just these overnight lending transactions between large, bar, between large financial institutions. And, and that also is a very short-term interest rate. The Fed intervenes in that by trading treasury securities. And in fact, that one-year treasury is, and, and the three-month treasury, those are instruments through which those Fed funds transactions actually take place. Yeah. And 
Well, so certainly, you know, if it was just a one-year um, investment, right? And and what did we see here? The one-year Treasury. I have to go back on my yield curve numbers up there. Um, but let's just pick a number. I don't remember what the one-year Treasury is right now. But let's pick a number. One-year rate is at two percent. Okay. And headline inflation is at 8%. And if it stays at 8%, then yes, in real terms, when you lend money to the federal government, the amount of stuff you can buy at the end of the year is going to be 6% less than what you, the money you gave them. But we've been in a world with negative real interest rates since 2010. So part of what's going on here is this need for us to get out of the extraordinary financial market interventions that we've had ever since the financial crisis back in 2008. Did that answer your question okay? Um, we, I'm going to make a definitive statement, which whenever you hear an economist make a definitive statement, you should run screaming. It's kind of a Halloween event. We will never see 3% mortgage rates again, okay? 3% fixed rate mortgages are not consistent with an economy that is healthy, growing at a healthy rate, with low inflation, and with nothing funky going on in financial markets. Why do I say that? Well, in, that, in order to get me to give you money, you know, my money today, and then you pay me back in the future, let's assume you pay me back with absolute certainty and that there's no inflation, okay? That would be what we call the real interest rate, the real risk-free rate. Certain I'll get my money back, no inflation at all. A reasonable level to expect that real risk-free rate is the underlying growth rate of the economy, okay? How fast is the economy growing? That, that, should, that should balance out over time to be that real risk-free interest rate. Return to compensate me for de deferring my consumption to the future, okay? Let's call that 2%, okay? Then I need to be compensated for the fact that the dollars that you pay me back won't buy as much because of inflation. Let's assume the Fed gets us back to this its inflation target of 2%. So now we're at a 4% rate but that doesn't take into account the fact that some of you out there are deadbeats and won't pay me back my money. And so we have to add in a risk premium in that. I personally think that the sort of normal mortgage rates in an economy that is growing at a healthy rate, that has low inflation, and that has nothing extraordinary happening in financial markets, Four and a half to maybe seven and a half percent is a range that I would say is a normal mortgage rate. So I actually don't think where we've been of that six, six and a half percent is an unreasonable expectation of long term interest rates going forward. Why I think the federal, the, the mortgage bankers is forecasting it to go lower than that to five, five percent, that's still in my normal range. Part of that reflects the fact that the Fed still has trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities on their books. They bought, they started buying mortgage-backed securities, and I, I didn't include this slide. I had it last year when we talked, and I didn't include it this year. They started buying them in 2008 as a response, that quantitative easing, right? They were buying long-term securities. Well, that artificially drove mortgage rates lower and when the pandemic hit, they doubled down and increased it, nearly doubled what they had in terms of their mortgage-backed security holdings. That's why those rates went so low over the last couple of years. They are now in the process of tapering, where they are letting those mortgage-backed securities run off their books as they mature. But that's going to be a slow process. And, and, and it's why? Because all those people who got those great 2.5%, 3% interest rates are not just going to go willy-nilly and repay them for no reason. There has to be something to drive them to, to either need to move or they, they, they decide they just want to get rid of a nuisance payment on a house. Whatever it is, mortgage refinancings are going to slow down, which is going to extend the duration of those mortgage-backed securities. 
So it will take a long time for all of that to wind down. And so it's, we're not going to be in that world where we don't have something funky going on in financial markets for a while. Okay. Other questions on mortgage rates and inflation and interest rates? My students sometimes think that I answer them into submission. They ask a question and then I give them much more than they ever wanted. So, so once again, I wanted to go back and give some more historic perspective of longer term what's been happening in housing markets. So I went back, this is to 2003 with the home sales activity for the Lawrence Board of Realtors. And you can see from this that you were averaging, what, 130 home sales a month back at the peak of the, of the, of the housing boom back in the early 2000s. And then home sales activity declined. Again, that blue line on there is the moving average. So it cuts through the seasonal trends. And, and declined down to a place where you were about 75 home sales a month at the bottom of the very worst of it following the financial crisis. And then had some strong growth and some then just steady growth. And we've been up around 125, 130 home sales a month on average. The past year has seen a slowdown in that activity. And you all have seen it, you've been aware of it. Um, certainly we never got back to the place where we were back in the early 2000s. Um, but even with the decline right now, we're still back where we were averaging 2016, 2017, 2018. So perspective of where we've been, I think is a helpful thing to have. I'm always interested in your perspective, but from a statistical perspective, I see a bigger part of the problem on the supply side of the market, not the demand side of the market. Now, just because I see things statistically doesn't mean that people behave that way, and that's where all of you give me a lot of insights. But again, historic perspective. We started tabulating statistics for Lawrence back in 2010, that was at the height coming out of the financial crisis. You can see where the, act, this is the number of homes that were actively listed in the Lawrence MLS system. And it was up almost 700 homes there at the peak. That was high in part reflecting the downturn in the financial, in, in the markets following the great, great recession. Since 2011, we've been steadily whittling that away, and we got down to a place in 2015 that was probably more normal, where we had 400 homes available for sale, and then settled in at about 300 homes available for sale for a number of years. That was tight inventory at that point in time. Then all of a sudden, the pandemic happens, and we were concerned that that was going to drop off demand. And although we said we were concerned that would cause demand to drop off, I said that's not a terrible thing because inventories are so tight, we need something to give a little bit of slack in housing markets. Well, instead, as you all know, demand just went through the roof. And as I think about it, you know, it's, it's always easy for economists to tell you what happened after the fact. We don't predict very well in advance. But I think there are five things that happened that led to a perfect storm for a, a you know, what's happened in housing markets. Number one, and I mentioned this before, the people who are most likely to be home buyers, it turned out they were able to pivot and work from home much more easily. The home buying population as opposed to renters was much less likely to have been laid off during the downturn, okay? Number two, even if we weren't laid off, we all got stimulus checks from the federal government as, as an attempt to try and prevent some of the worst fallout from the pandemic shutdowns. Number three, we got those stimulus checks. We didn't lose our jobs, but we couldn't go out to eat. We couldn't travel. A lot of the things that we might ordinarily spend our money on, we couldn't spend. And so people started paying down debt. Financial situations were in much better shape. They were surplus of cash. Lenders, you had lots of money in your deposits, right? Trying to put money out. It was, um, 
Financially, people were in the best position ever to be able to buy. Number four, they were stuck at home. They were sitting around looking at their own four walls. I think less of that demand was not as much about people who need more space because of the pandemic shutdowns and work from home. I think some of it was just, man, I'm sick of this place, cabin <laughs> fever. And so they start to look for something different. And then number five, when mortgage rates then dropped down below 3%, people said, this is the last chance I'll ever have. If I don't do this now, I'll never be able to do it. And so for a lot of years here where we'd been you know, whittling down our inventories of homes available for sale, that was like laying down a lot of, of, of kindling for this fire. We just kept putting little twigs down there and some underbrush and some other things. And then all these five factors came along in the pandemic and took a blowtorch to it. And it lit a bonfire in the housing market that is what caused the extraordinary circumstances. We had a already tight supply situation that was then met with a, an incredible increase in demand that was already strong demand in the first place. And so what is our home sales forecast? Um, we had been, you know, you declined last year already down 2.8%. That was, you were declined 2.8% in spite of the fact that demand had been accelerated so much. That's a reflection of a lack of inventory. Okay, some markets increased last year. Lawrence declined slightly last year. You're on pace right now to decline almost another 5% this year. That now seems to be two factors. One is higher mortgage rates are clearly influencing demand and it's clearly cutting back what, where people are. But we're still in a situation where it's tight inventories. And so both of those together are causing home sales to decline this year. We're projecting that to be relatively flat next year. I don't think demand is going to get substantially worse over the next year. Obviously, if we end up with a much deeper recession than, than, than has been forecast, that, could be, that would be subject to change. But the supply issues continue. And so even with demand where it is, we don't have enough inventory to really be able to, to have some home sales activity increase tremendously. So one of the takeaways I want you to have here is that even as demand softens, I think it's going to continue to be a seller's market. And one of the ways that we measure this is through a number called month supply. You can't see on this slide here, uh, you never know what's gonna happen with projectors and things. I actually have a little shading that's between the four and six months point. So what is month supply? We take the number of homes actively listed and we divide it by the average pace of sales over the prior year. And so if we have say 500 homes that are available on the market, and we sell on average 100 homes a month, that's 500 divided by 100, a five month supply. Traditionally, we think of a balanced market as being one with between a four and six month supply. Above six months, that would tend to favor buyers. Below four months, it would tend to favor sellers. Well, Lawrence is the blue line here, and that has been in this technical seller's market since 2014, okay? We haven't had enough inventory for almost a decade now. And that went way down in the, in the last year, down, we were at a two month supply prior to the pandemic, and now it's down around a one month supply. Really, really, really tight inventories, much more so than what you see in the US as a whole. And we've not seen the increase the way that you've seen in some of the other markets across the United States. There's one other measure that, that you've heard some things in the media talking about, which is discounted listings. What fraction of homes are selling at a price that is below their original list price? And what fraction of homes that are on the market have had a price decrease, okay? So at the top here, you see this is for sold listings. And for a lot of years, we were sitting at about 80% of all homes that sold 
sold at a discount compared to the original list price. That's just the normal negotiation process, right? Hey, I listed at 200, I make an offer at 190, maybe they accept 195, that's sold at a discount, okay? Over the, you know, since 2014, when we started going into a seller's market, you saw that fraction of homes selling at a discount began to go down and down and down. And it dropped down to about 60% prior to the onset of the pandemic. Again, that was a strong seller's market there. Lots, if 60% sell at a discount, that meant that 40% of all homes sold at or above list price. Okay. Then the pandemic hit, and you can see, and again, it's not the pandemic that caused this, it's the policy responses to the pandemic. You can see that that, that sale price as a percent of list, that just dropped way, way down, to discounted listings dropped way down to about 35, 30%. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I will say, I put this slide together earlier this week, and there's been this big jump up just in the last month or two here, where it jumped back up to 60%. That will be interesting to see if that's just kind of a one month anomaly or something was strange there. You all can tell me that because you're seeing these negotiations that happen as they happen. But even at 60%, that's just back to where we were prior to the pandemic where we already said that was a place where we had tight inventories and it was a strong seller's market. So I look at all of this and I still see a situation where the lack of inventory will continue to cause the market to favor sellers even as demand slacks off in the face of the higher mortgage interest rates. Another way we can see that is through the median days on market. Actually, that says in Kansas, that's, a, that's me not getting an item changed. That's actually in Lawrence. This is the median days on market in Lawrence. And what you can see is, you know, we, again, really historic perspective. How long did it take homes to sell? Homes were selling typically in a 40 to 50 days back in the early 2000s. It went up to... Um, about a 65 day uh, at, the, at the height. We then saw the very worst in, in 2012, and it's been coming down ever since. Prior to the pandemic, typical days on market was 20. That was fast. Those of you with perspective, 20 days on market, where half of the homes sell less than 20 days, that's, not, that, that, that's, a, that's a fast number for things that are out there. Remember, there are some of those listings that have been there for three years. Right? Sometimes those things are there for a long time. Again, when we came with all the issues over the last two years, that median days on market um, is down. I forget what the number is right now, but it's, it's around a week, something like that. And it's, it's gone up a little bit here, but, but it's still pretty short. One of the things that I hear, and this is, again, me just repeating back to all of you what you tell me, is that what we're beginning to see as mortgage rates have gone up is that the prime of the market, the most attractive, most desirable homes, not that much difference. Maybe we're not getting 12 listings, 12 offers above asking price in a matter of 24 hours, but we still might be getting five offers at or above asking price in the first few days. But other segments that had been really on fire have slowed down to what would be historic perspective more normal responses in the market. Now, does that sound, am I, am I hearing you all right? Because this is where it's your experiences, not what I'm seeing in the data, but it, it matches what's in the data. Well, as a result of that, we see this sharp increase in home price appreciation. And again, it, it's, we were at this uh, price, price appreciation that I said, oh, we needed this. We needed stronger home price appreciation to offset the increase in costs of new home construction and the flat numbers that we had for a lot of years following the pandemic. And so we were around a 5% appreciation. That's good, strong, but healthy, normal appreciation for this market. After all of the stimulus that we had in the wake of the pandemic, that just took off. Through the first half of this year, 
the typical home value in Lawrence, Kansas increased by about 17% compared to where it was 12 months earlier. That's just unheard of, and it's not sustainable, okay? Our forecast is that home price appreciation will slow this year we see it dropping down to where it's only going to be 12.3% increase for this year. Again, that's just reflecting we're still sort of recovering from all of the things that we had. I will be absolutely stunned if we see actual negative home price appreciation in any of our markets in Kansas, but especially in Lawrence over the next year or two. I'll be stunned by that. Our forecast is that home price appreciation next year will drop down to that 4.8% level. And again, any other time compared other than the last two years, we would have said, wow, that's really good, strong home price appreciation. That's really great for our market. At the end of the day, the supply constraints will keep it from turning into a buyer's market. And so when you don't have enough inventory, buyers can't then start to push down prices further because it's like, what else are you gonna buy? And by the way, you can't just say, oh, well, I'll rent instead because rents have been going up at a tremendously fast pace and occupancy rates are there. And so that brings into a question of why do we have such a shortage of housing? And there are two things that I want to have. So this is new home construction. This is single family building permits in the Lawrence metropolitan area. So it's all of Douglas County. And you can see that back 1995, 2000, up until really the financial crisis, Lawrence, you were averaging about 40 new single family building permits a month. In the wake of the financial crisis, you've been below 20, less than half as much new home construction as what you had prior to the financial crisis. And while there are a couple of spikes, by the way, those, those big spikes that, that you see back there for like 2016, 2017, I've tried to figure out what's going on with that because I talked to all of you and said, we didn't see any big new spikes in single family permits. I talked with the Census Bureau that compiles these numbers. I go with what the official numbers are reported I think those two spikes are not actually there, um, but you, know, you go with the official numbers. Sometimes data is crappy and you just have to deal with it. So what about apartments? You know, we've been seeing you know, all this new apartment development. Well, not really that much new apartment development. You know, so this is total building permits, not just single family, but adding two family, multifamily and so forth. Not really that much that we've seen compared to the rest of, of the economy. So, so apartments aren't fixing the problem, even though we have had some new apartment projects. Here's another factor that I don't think we're taking into account. A question that I've asked myself is, how do we have such strong demand for both owner-occupied homes and renter-occupied homes when we're not seeing this really strong population growth? Well, there's one other factor that comes into play, which is how many people live in a housing unit. And back in 2020, we were averaging, this is nationwide, 2.62 people per household, okay? And that changed a little bit. You can see that it's, it, it's a long-term, that's been a long-term decline that we've seen in the average number of people per household. In the, in the wake of the financial crisis, we saw a pretty sharp increase in the average people per household, but pretty rapidly, you know, I lost my house, I had to move back in with somebody else, so that re increased the number of people per household, but that began going down again. We saw a very slight spike in 2020 during the shutdowns, but that again has come down. We're now down to a place where it's 2.51 people per household. Well, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and I gotta go look at my cheat sheet here, so bear with me with that. In Douglas County, your population right now is estimated at 119,363. If you had the 2.51 people per household that the US has on average, that requires 47,555 occupied housing units. 
if we had the same number of people per household we had back in 2000, that would require only 45,558. That's a difference of almost 2,000 housing units just because of the change in people per household. So we need to add housing stock, both owner-occupied and renter-occupied housing stock, based on population growth that we have. We need to add housing stock because, quite frankly, some of that old housing stock, as much as I love old homes, anybody ever seen the, uh, the old movie with, I think it was Cary Grant, Mr. Blanding Builds His Dream House? It was actually the movie that The Money Pit was a remake of. And he goes around, he's bought this old house, and he goes to all of these developers and, and builders, and, and every single, there's just this montage of scenes where all the developers just say, knock it down, knock it down, knock it down. Sometimes those old homes just need to be demolished and replaced, okay? And so we've got to replace old housing stock that just doesn't, isn't physically of the right element or it doesn't meet the needs. It might be okay housing, but it's not what people want anymore. So we've got to replace housing stock. We've got to add new for new population. We also need to add new housing stock to reflect changing household composition. And this, I think, is part of what's been driving this increased demand that we've seen and made the, the lack of building that we've had such a severe, what's really become almost a crisis level across not just Lawrence, but across much of the state in terms of not having enough housing. So what is our forecast for new home construction? Unfortunately, it's not really that strong. Um, we're forecasting a slight increase of 5% uh, next year, down 3.6. That's really just sitting around right at that 270 new single family building pits permits a year that we've had for a long time. And like I said, that. That spike in 2018, I don't really believe that spike was there. We've just been bouncing around this level for a long time, and it's not enough to build and to account for the housing demand. And so that means, although I think demand will taper off, this is going to continue to put upward pressure on home prices. Um, and unfortunately, with the construction costs going up the way they have, this, this housing isn't getting any cheaper either. So it will continue to create affordability issues. Wow, that was a lot, but I think it's all there. This is our summary forecast. We also have copies of all of the housing forecasts. I actually have copies of Wichita, Lawrence, Manhattan, Topeka, out in my car, but I did bring in some Kansas City forecasts here if you want to take those with you. If you want me to get others, I'll get them for you as well. And they're all available on the Center for Real Estate's website. If you just go to wichita.edu slash real estate, you can get all our housing forecasts. You can get my presentation from today. I have no idea how much extra time I took from what I was supposed to. Um, but that's where we are. Thanks again to Security First Title and Meritrust. I can take a couple of minutes to ask questions, but if you need to leave and go do a deal, go close a deal, okay? <laughs> So, with that, are there any other questions? Yes? So, um, how do you square in the data for the number of forecasted uh, sales in the future when you have uh, a shift? Like, basically, at the beginning of this year, almost 100% of home owners could have sold their house and bought a new house and ended up on the right side of that transaction to now, with the increase of interest rates, almost no one can do that. So you've gone to a place where people that were selling their house become buyers. Now you don't have the sellers and you don't have the buyers, but you have the level of sales being the same and new inventory is constrained. So how do you how do you estimate that you're going to have the same number of sales when you have much so, so the question here was one, I think is really a question of lock-in buyers, right? That I've got homeowners that now have these really low interest rates that they got during this period of time. And will they become locked in and therefore that provide a further dampening of demand? They don't, they don't become buyers to move up because they don't want to sell and lose their existing interest rate. And yet they also, then that limits the supply that would go on with those. And so I think that's kind of where your question is with it. 
Nobody here is old enough to have been in the market back in the early 1980s and the uh, late 1970s. So a few people are. This is not a new phenomenon in terms of a situation where market rates have gone up and I've got prospective buyers or prospective sellers that may be not wanting to give up their really great low mortgage rates, okay? People buy and sell, I think Nestor Wigand Sr. down in Wichita, he said, people are always buying and selling, it's just for different reasons, depending on the market. And certainly the sort of, I'm just bored with my house and I want something different, those people are much less likely to sell and then become buyers because of the lock-in effect. But most of the reason that people buy homes is because of a life situation change. I've got a new job. We have new kids. I just got married. I just got divorced. My kids have moved out. I'm worried about steps. I want to have a, a lower maintenance lifestyle. Whatever that is, there are lots of things that people move them to, to make transactions. I'm relatively sanguine about the impact of that lock-in effect. Will it be there some? Absolutely. There will be some limits there. But I think ultimately people adjust. And I don't really want to lose my 3% mortgage rate and move into a 6.5% or 7% mortgage rate or 5% wherever it ends up. But my life situation has changed and this all makes sense for me and I can make it work financially. Um, I think that, you know, you'll see these short term and you'll hear lots of anecdotes of people where that's the case, but that will smooth out in a relatively short period of time. I could be wrong, but that's my perspective on it. Go ahead. So the second follow up to that is uh, you talk about FOMO, fear of missing out, interest rates are the lowest, mm -hmm. this is my only chance. Mm -hmm. Well, that feeling is now gone, so people don't feel like they can miss mm -hmm. So people saw that coming. That would have pulled forward all sorts of stuff from the future years. So that's another thing on the constraint of activity moving forward. So I'm just questioning how we get to the same level of activity next year and the year following that with all of these factors that are damping supply and demand. Really great question. So he asked basically if what we saw during the pandemic was an acceleration of future demand, yeah. right? People were buying now because it was their last chance to do it with these really low interest rates, then maybe that means that some of the people that would have been buying next year or the year after are no longer in the market because they don't just go and buy every single year. And certainly there could be some of that. But the flip side that I hear from a lot of realtors is that there are some buyers who are coming back into the market that had been so discouraged during the last two years that they kept losing out, that, that that's actually offsetting some of the lost demand. There's no question, demand is going to be lower over the coming year. But I think the constraint that we've been seeing in sales over the past four or five years wasn't demand, it was supply. And so it, you know, supply constraints were what were limiting us. As demand softens, it won't be the intense bidding wars that we had previously, but I still think there's room for those transactions and normal life things to happen. Again, you can tell me I'm wrong and, 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 and that could be very well be the case. This is just where we see things in terms of that balance right now. Other questions? Yeah. So since we're all playing the assumption game, let's assume that Panasonic has this. Mm -hmm. okay, because some people might not particularly will. But let's say it's, uh, Panasonic happens and the other 15 or 20 or 30 uh, industry companies that orbit that will be in our environment as well. Douglas County is 150,000 population total. This is right on our doorstep. How does that impact what you So we talked about this last night at dinner, and he knows my answer to that. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I'll, uh, you said, let's play the assumption game, and it reminded me of that classic Joe Pesci, Pesci line, right? I think that was it from Goodfellas. Whenever we assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Um, first things first. This forecast is only through the end of next year. I don't think that 
Panasonic is going to have a huge impact on that in the course of this next year. Um, and construction workers are often doing temporary type housing and other things. So that's, that, that's not seeing that here. It, you know, I, I look at a lot of these economic development projects, and I often think that they tend to overpromise and underdeliver. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that's not going to be the case with this, and you mentioned down in Arizona as an example. Um, it's really, really, really hard. And, you know, so we'll have to have substantial in migration of skilled workers to be able to absorb this. Because the first class that you have with these things is that people are going to just move from other jobs in the larger Kansas City, Lawrence, even Topeka, you know, this larger area, that they will just change jobs. And that won't necessarily translate into immediate housing needs or housing changes. But then you have more shortages in across other industries, right? And so, you know, will we see that migration of population to account for that? Some of it could be com coming from other parts of Kansas, right? You know, from southeast Kansas, southwest, you know, things like that. Uh, but that's going to happen over time. Um, certainly, if it follows through the way that is projected, then there will need that will put even more shortage of housing units of all types throughout this region. And so you, I would never want to encourage small communities to get ahead of that game. And I just offer Junction City as my caution for that when they did all this new home, uh, platting of new home developments and they did all the specials on those new home developments for the big red one buildup that ended up not happening the way they thought. You've got, they, they did not handle that well. Okay, they did not pace, they, they were trying to say, we're gonna be ahead of it and we're gonna have it all in place so everything can go. Pace yourself, prove it over time, especially if you're a smaller community because it can be devastating if you, if, you, if you get out in front of that too fast. Um, but certainly you wanna be doing things to make it easier to add housing as, as the market moves. Um, I, I've always been a big believer that when I teach my development class, I, we used to have it a part of the, the uh, public administration program would have students take our real estate development class so that when they are on the other side of the table in those things, that they had some perspectives of what are the issues that developers go through. And one of the biggest takeaways and lessons that we had here is that you can throw all the money in the world you want at something, and that often doesn't really move the needle very much. I mean, developers are going to take your money, right? Everybody's going to take your money if you give them money. But the more that you can provide them with certainty and ease, remove the barriers and all the checkpoints that we go through, time is a more valuable commodity than an incentive in most instances. And if I can know with certainty when I get started, here's my process, here's how it will happen, here's how I will end up, then we could spend an awful lot less money as communities if we just made the process as smooth and easy as we could. You may quote me on that. So, other questions? Yeah. Um, do you guys see any issues with uh, systemic risk to rentals with housing uh, programs uh, to help people through the pandemic with free, you know, getting rent subsidies and stuff, and interest rates going up because rentals tend to be highly leveraged. So now that you can't refinance and you can't, you can't take money out, I'm just really concerned that their next big thing that people aren't looking at is a rental bust where people can't pay their rent. There's huge uh, getting out of rentals and then the rental market kind of imploding. So the question is whether we foresee any, you know, the next big problem that nobody's looking at is the uh, rental market and whether or not there could be a rental market bust as with we've seen these sustained rent increases and borrowers who may be owners who may be highly leveraged and so forth. And then what would be sort of a necessary precursor to that would be a substantial employment downturn. Or just a reduction in subsidies to people that get rent subsidies from the government. Because those programs are, are in, going away. They're sunset. So 
Um, I will be. I will tell you that I, in terms of my familiarity with all of those rental subsidy programs and things, I'm not as familiar with those, so I wouldn't speak to that aspect of things. I have not heard among my sort of rental contacts, and this is both large property managers and small property owners, mostly in the Wichita area. That's where I where I get the anecdotal information. I have not heard from them significant concerns. My, my perspective is that um, the financing situations for them has not been over leveraged. It's just been kind of typical leverage. And that, um, you know, they've, in many instances, they've actually sort of pulled back over the last two years in terms of their acquisitions because they don't want to overpay when, when there have been these bidding wars. Now, again, Lawrence could be totally different because every housing market is local, okay? Um, but I've not heard those concerns. My, my concerns would be more one on, on you know, massive layoffs and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody's got to have a place to live, right? And so if they, if they you know, if they, the, the way that that gets resolved, if you have massive um, um, evictions and so forth because people can't afford things, is ultimately then they're gonna to have to go back and live with somebody else, so that increase in, in people per household. But that long-term trend hasn't been changing, right? I mean, it's, we've had little blips, but that long-term trend has, has continued to go down. Um, I'll think about that one more. Uh, as you said, it's something that nobody's talking about, which means it's also something people aren't thinking about as much, and, and those are the things you ought to think about before they happen. Um, but uh, let's talk more on that, because I don't have a better answer than that one. Other questions? Well, I want to thank you all so much. It's so great to come here to Lawrence. I always enjoy it. I appreciate the great turnout. Please, please, please take copies of those forecasts back to your office with you. I know that the staff would really appreciate not having to lug them back uh, with, for them. If you each take 20, 30 copies, it goes away pretty quick. Thank you again. You all have a wonderful day.